So uh, <coughs> today we have uh, Professor uh, Gonzalo Correa from uh, uh, TU Delft. He's a professor. Oh, yeah, he's still assistant professor. Although he's tenured uh, yes. right there <laughs> at TU Delft in the Department of Transport and Planning. Uh, and his work is uh, focused on transport demand management through the study of integrated transportation, intelligent transportation systems, travel behavior, and land use interactions. Uh, I can also uh, uh, speak on his behalf that he's done a lot of work on uh, shared mobility and autonomous vehicle uh, uh, systems, so uh, it's really quite a pleasure for him to uh, be here today to share some of his work with us. So uh, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, indeed, that's my name. It's a Portuguese name. I'm not Dutch. And I've been living in the Netherlands for uh, the last six years, uh, working at uh, TU Delft, the Department of Transport and Planning. It's my pleasure to give this talk today about some of the work that we have been doing in the last few years at UDELT. So I'm going to talk about shared on-demand automated uh, vehicles, specifically for the first and last mile connection to uh, transit systems. But there's the word beyond there. So I'm also going to talk about door-to-door -door a bit and try to kind of set some uh, paths for future research uh, as well. And this is a picture of Amsterdam. If you want to visit, it's a very nice city, it's the capital of the country, but we are located more in the south here, and this is actually not working because it's a screen, so maybe, let's see, let's see, there's a point here, I like the point. Yeah, it doesn't, it reflects, sorry, uh, doesn't it doesn't work, it doesn't work on the screen. It doesn't work on the screen, so I'm going to use my own hands, <coughs> the, the old traditional way, so we are more on the south, close to the, the big port of Rotterdam, it's also a very touristic uh, city there. And the university is the main activity that we have in that city. It has almost the size of the city itself, or at least the uh, old city center. This is the campus of the university, and uh, we are located here at uh, the Faculty of Civil Engineering. It's a very big faculty, typically 600 students choose civil engineering. And then they are channeled to different master programs. We have our Department of Transport and Planning that offers a track of this master in civil engineering. And uh, it has been connected a lot with traffic systems, operations. But in the last years, it has expanded a lot. So we have a lot of different uh, subjects, traffic safety, uh, public transport uh, uh, operations, uh, uh, as another example. We have a lot of, for example, lately uh, modeling of active modes, bicycles, pedestrians as well. So if you are curious about work uh, done by other colleagues, just drop me an email and I can make a, a connection to them. And uh, since it's such a huge department, I think it's still the biggest department of transportation research in Europe, we've decided lately to divide the department into labs according to different topics and the expertise of the different people. So I've been leading this lab, which we like to call the heat lab, research on um, electric and automated uh, transport. And I'm co-leading this with a colleague of mine called Mang Wang. He works more on intelligent vehicles, on how the vehicles are going to decide to overtake, to change lanes, for example. I work more on operations and planning of transportation systems. So I think we kind of connect very well in that sense. We, work on different uh, modeling levels. So I invite you to um, consult our web page if you want to know more about our activities and, and the connection between this and the other labs. Because uh, I may be leading this lab, but I'm also participating in the lab, for example, of a smart PT. Uh, Odev Katz is leading this. He was here last year, by the way, if you were here already. Um, and uh, they can also be part of our lab, so we kind of interchange a bit. Depends on, on our research. So in order to start this presentation, I would like to start with the, the traditional problem. Many research papers start like that. We have a problem, a lot of traffic congestion, right? Most of the papers, or 70 or 80 percent of the papers start like that. This is a picture of uh, the city of Detroit in the beginning of the 20th century. There was a lot of traffic congestion. There were a lot of people buying this 4T model. We already saw that the car could bring some negative consequences. Of course, that many years have passed. And then today, what we have is just the exacerbation 
of this massive usage of uh, private cars. This is a typical video that now we see every year in the United States. Thanksgiving in LA, everybody trying to visit their families to celebrate Thanksgiving. So this is just the, you know, the exponential of what was happening in the beginning of the 20th century. To be fair with Europe, we don't have such extreme situation. So there has been a very big investment on uh, public transportation infrastructure, public transportation services. I would not say that we have such um, negative situation, but even in the Netherlands, that is a country that has a lot of bicycle usage, a very good public transport infrastructure, still there's gridlock. There's a lot of traffic congestion because it's a small country, 17 million inhabitants, and uh, people living in one city working in another one, so even with the trains that we have there, there's still a challenge with a lot of private uh, car usage. And we know that this has all the negative externalities on pollution, people's time, etc. I'm more interested in urban areas because this is where indeed we have the biggest problems. And the urbanized um, people, so to speak, people who live in cities is only increasing. So there's now more people living in cities than in rural areas, that's a fact. And uh, a lot of countries already have more people living in cities, but for example, China doesn't. 42%, at least with the numbers of this, of this chart at that time, I think this has like three years. So more people are even going to join the Chinese cities, and there's a lot of challenges there because you already have very, very big cities. So there is a problem of managing so many people in these places. And they are going to continue coming because they want better jobs. They want uh, you know, access to very good public health. The biggest hospitals are located in the biggest cities. So people want to join those areas. There's another interesting trend, which is the aging of the population. It's a very, very important problem in Europe. Also Japan, maybe in China, it will start happening. This is the median of the ages of the population in Europe. Started with 30 something years old, and now it's only getting worse. 40, you'll see numbers of projections of even 50 years old. Meaning 50% of the population is older than 50 years old. Imagine that. So it's a lot of old people that you need to manage with your transportation system. And older people have a different behavior, have different needs. We have to keep this in mind. Other trends on behavior are the millennials, the so-called millennials. They, they have uh, other requirements, or they have a different type of uh, uh, behavior regarding mode choice. Uh, in the United States, we saw, for example, that in 2015, people were buying less cars. This doesn't mean that they are using less the car. Maybe they are using Uber, for example. But this was a trend that maybe people were not expecting so much. Some people have said that maybe it was the crisis, that this is going to go up again, that the younger generations are going to start pursuing again the car because it's so comfortable, it's so interesting, so attractive. But you know for sure that the millenniums are different because Uber systems were not there in the past. So now it's very, very easy to just request a ride from Uber and it's becoming part of our daily lives. And you know, Uber is nothing. I mean, they like to say that they are nothing. They are not a transportation company. They are just putting people in contact with each other, drivers with riders, right? So that's their excuse. And this is happening in a lot of businesses, Facebook, Alibaba. And um, the problem is that they actually disrupt the mobility system of our cities. So that's also a challenge. How do you make these companies part of um, a mobility system that should be more sustainable, not less sustainable. It should be moving towards a more sustainable mobility. So that's an issue that we have to tackle. In Europe, there's a big movement of bringing back public space for you know, pedestrians, cyclists, public transport, but not for cars. Okay, That's not the idea. So for example, the city of Amsterdam has set the goal of getting rid of the cars by 2030. It's very ambitious because still the city of Amsterdam has a lot of cars there, but that's the goal. And this is uh, being assumed by uh, governments uh, in many cities around Europe, not just in the Netherlands, but Sweden, but even in the southern part of Europe, even Lisbon, where I come from originally, 
there's a big movement towards entering the public space. And information technologies, also very interesting process that has happened in the last 15 years. You know, even if people are not going to buy a car, they are going to keep in their pockets a cell phone that is very, very smart. It's a, a small computer that allows them, of course, to order an Uber ride or you know, check how to go from A to B by public transport. It's becoming so easy now to use these uh, Google Maps or other apps that make it so easy for you to say, OK, yeah, it's, it's just that bus that is coming. It's, it's making it very easy to pay, for example, with the mass services, mobility as a service. So this is a reality that we should take into consideration. We are taking into consideration in envisioning the future of, uh, of mobility. Specific topic that I come to discuss is about vehicle automation. And this was already happening uh, 20 years ago in the Netherlands. This, this system is operated with automated uh, buses, so to speak, in Rotterdam, has transported millions of inhabitants. Of course, that here it's easier because this path is segregated, it's protected. So there's only like two intersections where there's going to be a conflict with other cars or with uh, um, even cyclists and pedestrians. So it's easier to manage, okay? And they are going now to the third generation of vehicles in continuous operation. This is um, a uh, company that is uh, providing the vehicles, it's called To Get There, but the company that is operating this is a huge multinational called Transdev, which is a public transport operator. So this was already a reality. Of course, that the dream is we go beyond this. We go to the common roads. It's very easy to deploy automated shared systems because I can put them everywhere. Okay, It's called full automation. And I just want to mention also electrification because it's in everybody's minds. It's happening. And it's also happening in the Netherlands. Uh, besides the huge network of slow chargers, there's also a very big network of fast charging facilities uh, in the country. Uh, this company, FastNet, is the one that has most of this network, has been growing by, I would say, by the month. They are always inaugurating new fast charging stations, which makes it much easier to uh, decide to buy an electric vehicle, because you can trust that you can charge your car faster if you need it, okay? So a lot of trends happening in the mobility system, but also in society, um, technology, um, and this has led to a plethora of different modes, innovations, uh, car sharing. I've done a lot of research about traditional car sharing systems. Um, also, traditional public transport operators are trying to make their transport systems more flexible because they saw what happened with Uber and Lyft and they want a chunk of this market as well. Uh, Abel was a system being tested in Amsterdam by the company Transdev, by this uh, public transport, private public transport operator. And uh, they stopped, but it was one first attempt. Maybe there's other companies <coughs> attempting again these flexible systems. Um, I already mentioned uh, automation and then mobility as a service is a big thing in Europe. I think that the United States is still catching up uh, in terms of mass. It's a big thing. It's been tested in a lot of countries. In the Netherlands also has a lot of pilots of different types of mass ap applications. One of the biggest is uh, in Amsterdam. So mass, you probably know what it is, right? So it's integrating public transport, but also the new modes, car sharing, uh, ride hailing into the same platform and making it very easy for you to travel for from A to B, so the same paying method. Um, you don't have any excuse to uh, make um, a choice on your mode of transport. So we have a lot of things happening, but I'm going to focus more on the vehicle automation, which is the hot topic of the last years, I would say the last six years. I'm not sure if we are going to continue having this, such a kind of energy on doing research on automation. Maybe we are in the descending part of the curve already. I'm not sure, I've been debating this with other people, but it's for sure something interesting uh, and an opportunity for changing the transportation system. What we need to see is if we can take this opportunity to make the system more sustainable. 
that's a very big, big table, not nice to present, of course, in <laughs> presentations, but probably you are aware of this. It's the different levels of automation as classified by the Society of Automotive uh, Engineers. And um, clearly there's some levels before what we call high automation. It's those systems that help you in your cars today. If you have a sophisticated car, the car can help you, you know, keep the lane, for example. But the systems in the future may be much more automated. We're talking about high automated levels talking about the vehicle driving itself, right? So you don't need a driving wheel even in the car. And the difference between the level four and level five is that in level four, you are constrained to a certain operational design domain, a certain area, for example, only in the city center or only in the freeway. And level five is a dream, is what uh, in to Delphi you are calling not in my lifetime level, okay? Even the younger people. <laughs> Uh, but I, this is actually something that uh, my manager, Bart Van Arum, usually says that he has an expert on, uh, on automated vehicles and he's becoming a bit more pessimistic lately. I think. So, but indeed, because we're saying automated everywhere, what is everywhere, right? It's really everywhere, so maybe it's a bit challenging. So exploring this idea of full automation, what can we do with full automation? And I've actually looked at two kinds of usages of fully automated vehicles. One that is more on the private side, so your private cars, imagine that they were automated. What does this represent to change the mobility patterns of a, of a city, costs, energy? But then there's this perspective of using the automated vehicles as, as public transport. And, and public transport can be indeed buses. I'm not so focused on buses but it can also be shared cars, shared fleets of cars. And this is where I have invested more on the, on the research with, with my group. Uh, usually I like to refer this work just to say that, you know, we don't know when the level five is coming. We have a paper uh, in which we use a system dynamics model to try to uh, kind of make a crystal ball to understand when the level is coming. The only conclusion that we took was that we don't know. Again, the conclusion in the paper is that you can be very optimistic and it can happen very fast, the take up of these vehicles. If you are pessimistic, it doesn't happen. And it depends on factors like investment on innovation, R&D. If companies invest a lot of money, this can accelerate a lot. But it can also depend on our behavior as travelers. If we want to share a lot, shared cars can help uh, turn over the fleet can help substitute fleets of vehicles faster because they are used more intensively. So every two years, every three years, you could be buying another car for the fleet. So this means that the take up of the vehicles could accelerate rather than with uh, private cars. So this is just what I'm going to say about this adoption of the electric, the electric, sorry, the automated vehicles. So I said there's a lot of usages of uh, vehicle automation, but I think it's a good thing to ask cities, if you are trying to solve their problems, what would they like to have from vehicle automation? And if you ask them what they would like to have, they often mention that they would like to have last mile transit, okay? They don't want, for example, so much private cars. They want to have last mile. And why is that? But because you have invested so much on public transportation, infrastructure and services, you know, you are not going now to close a tunnel of the subway because you are going to offer shared cars everywhere in the city. But yes, cities have a problem, maybe not in the core in the city centers where you have a lot of public transport supply, good frequencies, but once you get out of this city center, when you have lower densities, lower demand, you start having an issue with the first and last mile connection. Because you may have actually a good train station, the problem is to arrive at the train station to go to your final destination, or as you arrive at the train station to go to um, your, your workplace, etc. So this is something that in the Netherlands we have been concerned about. We have a lot of bus systems there, but some of them are really very bad in terms of uh, the finances of the regions to have to, to fund such systems. So this is actually the color of our trains there in the Netherlands. That's the problem that I'm talking about, going from home to the station 
car going from the station to your um, workplace. That's the challenge. We have a lot of options. We have uh, car sharing, for example. It's a station-based, uh, mostly round-trip car sharing system. You will have to take the car back to the train station. We have a very big success with the shared bicycles. These are bicycles, they are called OV bicycles. OV is the initials of public transport in Dutch. It's a great success, a lot of users. Sometimes you, you have a lot of bicycles, but still you'll find zero bicycles because there's so many people using them. You have, of course, traditional public transport, the buses, which are mostly operated by concession. Um, and as I told you, a lot of issues with you know peak hours where they are packed and off peak where they are totally empty and the region pay. And um, also now new options with the ride hailing. You have, you have always had the taxis, but not so many. But you now you have the ride hailing option. It's an expensive option, of course, still. And not always available in all of the stations. And if you go to stations in areas that have low demand, you are not going to find easily an Uber car for your, um, for your connection. So we have a lot of issues, and this was in the back of our minds um, for the objective of studying shared uh, automated vehicles. Well, my field is not really looking at the vehicle itself, uh, but I think it's important to say that at UDELT we do research on all of these aspects, not just on the planning and operations of the system, but also looking at how these vehicles are going to drive on the road, and you know, there's still a lot of challenges there on making the vehicles safe, making them reliable, robust. One of the main projects that UDELF has led is called the WePod project, connecting a train station to a campus of another university, not ours. And still the vehicle is not doing the full route. It's still being tested because there's a lot of challenges, particularly on traffic lights, on traffic intersections. You have this system has to be totally safe. If it is not totally safe, if you have a problem, then this would be uh, very bad for the advancement of the research on vehicle automation. So we have to be very, very, very careful uh, in uh, putting these vehicles on the normal roads. You know, in the, in the Netherlands, we have a lot of bicycles, a lot of bicycles. Imagine that the vehicle cannot identify a bicycle in a very particular situation. I don't know, at night when it's raining, you have a problem. So have to be very, very careful uh, when uh, doing the real testing of the vehicles. Another uh, case study, which is very close to us because it's at the Delft campus, is a connection between the station of Delft South. So actually Delft is here and it has a main station, the most used station, but then there is another station, more secondary station here, which is closer to the campus. Since it's in our campus, we decided we are going to make it a case study out of this station, and also because the government has decided to invest a bit more on refurbishing the station and maybe reinforcing also some services there, the frequencies. They decided, okay, let's let's test the viability, the, the potential of using automated vehicles for making the connection between the station and the campus, even because there's no bus. So today, you only have an option which is a uh, cycle, or you can also walk, okay, but it can be quite far if you go to some of these faculties, okay? There was a bus, but the region decided not to sponsor the bus anymore because they were losing so much money with that specific bus. So this is the Google uh, view of the area. You have here the, the train station, and you have here the campus, the main part of the campus there, still a bit of a, of a distance, okay? Um, and in particular, if you go to that side of the campus is quite far. So this was our kind of excuse or case study for looking at the usage of automated vehicles, small automated vehicles. This is just the designs of the new station. It's actually going to be called Delft Campus. So it's going to bring the brand of to Delft to the transportation system as well. Well, we started with a project uh, called Door to Door. Um, 100% electric vehicle project, and uh, the idea was to use small vehicles. We used as our model the Renault Twizy, which is a very, very small 
a car, I mean, supposedly takes two people, but it doesn't take. Okay, it's just, it's very uncomfortable. I've, I had the experience of putting another person behind me, uh, and uh, it's particularly the Dutch, they are very tall, so they don't fit very well in this car. Uh, so yeah, let's imagine one person in these cars, and we were imagining the car to use the bicycle lane, because the bicycle lanes in the Netherlands are so wide that indeed the car fits on the bicycle lane. Um, it would be interesting even because, you know, you want to have the other lanes for other public transport, for the tram. There's going to be a tram here quite soon circulating. So, okay, let's use this. Uh, let's use the free capacity of the bicycle lane to put our future automated vehicles. So the type of studies that I do are more exemplified by this type of visualization that you see here. It's an agent-based model um, where we can test a fleet of cars. We can test different sizes of the fleets of the vehicles. We can uh, test the way you assign the vehicles to uh, the clients. This has just stopped. Okay. Um, you can test, for example, how to charge the vehicles and what the, what is the impact of these operational rules on the performance of the total system? On the operator, but also on the client. For example, how much time does the client have to wait in order to uh, use the system, depending on how you are operating this, this system? Uh, so we have published a paper. I'm going to show just one of the results about this. But another thing that I find interesting to show you here is that when I was doing this study, I was using what we call deterministic travel times, okay? not stochastic. There's no traffic model here. You just use the links on the network with a given travel time. But then we thought, OK, but these vehicles are using the bicycle lanes. Right? And in the bicycle lanes, there's bicycles. That's why they are called bicycle lanes, right? And we uh, found a master student to do a study with PTV, with software, vSIM, and also with the uh, another company, TAS, that produces this software called PreScan, in which we can simulate automated vehicles. So you can simulate all the systems of an automated vehicle, the cameras, where to put the cameras on the vehicle, and then those cameras are going to have a, a, an identification of the objects, which in this case are only bicycles, and then we can see how to optimize the circulation of these, of these vehicles on the normal lane or on the bicycle lane. So what we then conclude is that we were being too optimistic in this type of study. Because the bicycle lane, particularly at Delft, here in the middle of the park, at peak hours is crazy. It's one of the most used bicycle lanes in the Netherlands. So you have this huge flow of bicycles. So the dream of having a car in the bicycle lane here in the middle is really a dream. Because the, the vehicle would be stopped most of the time, it would be trying to overtake the bicycle, the bicycle trying to overtake, this would be actually a safety liability uh, also um, for, for the, the system. So this is just an exemplification of how sometimes for some problems you need a multi-level <coughs> modeling approach, not just looking at the bigger picture, you need to understand also what's happening on the micro level and then possibly bringing this back <coughs> to the more uh, macro level and have a better picture of what would happen in reality. But on the operational side, then you can test different things. And one of the advantages of automated vehicles uh, compared with normal car sharing systems that we have today is that you can relocate the vehicles without needing people to drive the cars. And uh, this has a big effect. I have some earlier papers about relocations on car sharing systems. And we clearly show that relocations help satisfying more demand and they also help for example this is the base scenario and you see what happens to different indicators we are decreasing a lot the average waiting time if we add relocations proactive relocations in the system okay maybe you need to charge the cars a bit earlier because they are going to drive a bit more but that's not a problem you are providing a better quality of service you're going to get a bit more money although we haven't done a financial analysis in this simulation um, case study, okay? So relocations are something that is uh, seen as one of the bigger advantages for shared mobility systems from using automated uh, cars. We don't only do the operational studies, we also do the 
planning studies and uh, in this case it was about the same case study same train station here of uh, Delft Zell but the question that uh, my PhD student had Xiao Yang was uh, on which should be the operational area that you should have such a uh, first last mile system operating I mean there could be somebody coming here to this station that would like to go very far where, where should you stop accepting such trips because then the vehicles have to come empty and this is money that you are going to lose because it's energy that uh, you are going to spend without any client so this is uh, basically an optimization model location choice model of uh, which specific areas to uh, join to aggregate in such a cluster of um, operation or catchment area let's say and, and then you can uh, in the optimization model you can run different scenarios um, for example it's interesting to see for a fleet of five cars uh, if you have electric cars or if you have conventional cars there is a difference on um, the performance of the system why because if you have the electric cars they need to charge and they are going to be idle so they are not going to be used for some time and this is not good for uh, satisfying the, the request so there is a difference there of course that if you increase your fleet size then this stops being a problem because you always have enough vehicles for uh, the different periods of um, of the day but you know buying cars costs money you have the depreciation costs and you see that the profit increases a bit but it's not a major increase so you know for each car that you are buying you are not getting the same marginal uh, added uh, profit uh, on the system so this is uh, also some, some work and I I'd like to present this work because um, there is a connection between planning and operations. Sometimes people try to kind of separate these two things. One is one thing is to plan the system, another one is to operate. But particularly in this kind of on-demand systems, the way you operate the system is going to greatly affect what you can plan. Okay, and if you consider planning, defining the operational area or defining the catchment area, yes, the two <coughs> things are connected um, some later work that we did uh, this is not published at all it was a master student who did this and she's not going to write any paper about it um, is on the physical aspect of these first last mile um, transportation systems um, we sometimes forget that vehicles occupy space and um, most of the studies just put the vehicles going around it's magical they stack up magically on one node of the network but the thing is that they are going to require space and this was a challenge put to us by ProRail which is the operator um, not operator <coughs> sorry the infrastructure owner uh, in the Netherlands so the infrastructure is separate from the operation of the trains and they wanted to know uh, what would be the impact on the future stations of these shared automated vehicle systems and uh, uh, you need parking for the vehicles to be stopped for when they are idle but you also need to consider there's going to be space uh, allocated to a queuing up because if you have a lot of people catching up these these vehicles and let's go to the peak hour or less half past eight you need to have a lot of space here for the queuing up of uh, uh, the vehicles to pick up people so you have these, these are more long-term parking areas and you also require, you don't, I mean, it's not mandatory, but it will be better to have this parking facility that is closer to the train station so that the vehicles can be activated quite quickly. If you are very far, the vehicles are very far from the train station, there is a request, you don't have enough time to come here and pick up the, the client from the train station. So here this was more like the redesigning of a future station is just a, an initial study on some tentative modeling of, of that. And um, we've also looked at first and last mile in uh, uh, not lower demand areas, but actually very high demand area. This is the south part of Rotterdam. They have here these two metro stations. And we had as research question to look at 
providing first and last mile transport to these two metro stations with automated shared vehicles. And we had an extra goal for this master uh, thesis work, which was to look at the financial issues. Can we have a company making a profit, operating a shared automated uh, system, supply first and last mile transport to just two metro stations, okay? There's many metro stations in Rotterdam, and I'm just focusing on two. Why the southern part? Because, you know, public transport in the southern part is not as great as in the northern part. I would still say it's great compared to the United States. <laughs> this is just a parenthesis. But, you know, it's a different reality, so they are very demanding. Maybe it's not enough. Uh, they still have a, me a metro system, as you see, but maybe the connections with the buses are not the best, and maybe the buses are losing money. So we were testing this uh, concept here with the financial aspects in mind. Can a company operating a shared automated vehicles system, first and last mile, make a profit? And why is that important? Because maybe in the future they will be interested in bringing their business to the cities. And then the question is, should authorities allow that? Okay, it's, it's the old question now becoming the old question, should Uber operate on my city? Should uh, you know, electric scooters be operating here? You know, there's a lot of companies that want to bring their innovations and we must decide then if uh, they should be allowed to operate or not the, the system. Um, and these are the two metro stations. Again, an agent-based model, as you see, it's not really a uh, traffic model because they are kind of flying over the, the network, right? So only the times are coming from a, a visual model, which is uh, this uh, more aggregated uh, model, okay? And looking at all aspects of the finances of such a company, we needed to depart from one point in terms of the quality of service that we wanted to offer. We really want to the maximum. We went to the maximum, meaning I don't want here to reject any passenger. Let's imagine I don't want to reject passengers. I would have to have 280 vehicles. This is a lot of vehicles. There's uh, cities in Europe that only have 300 car sharing vehicles for the whole city. A like car to go typically operates 400 vehicles, you know, maybe 500 vehicles. We are talking about just first and last mile to two metro stations, 280 cars. Okay, it's a lot of cars. And what I'm showing here is the finances of such a company. If you take everything into consideration, the wages of the employees, even if you don't have drivers, you need to pay. There are some employees, there's even the CEO. We even consider the cost of the salary of the CEO of the company, the energy costs, maintenance costs of the vehicles, and also the depreciation costs of the vehicles. You have to buy the vehicles. And even with the, all these costs, you can make a profit which is about 20% of everything. Uh, to be honest, we don't have the traffic modeling, right? We don't have the traffic congestion. Maybe the results could be different because you'd have more delays on the network. But this is like an indicator that this could be actually a good business for some companies. They could be willing in the future to come to our cities to operate such a thing. And we need to, of course, help cities decide if this is really what they want uh, to have. And um, besides the first and last mile uh, connections, I have always looked uh, to this door-to-door -door usage of shared cars. One of the earliest studies that we have done still back in Portugal, in the MIT Portugal program, was to look at, uh, not at Uber vehicles, because at that time Uber was not big at all, was at shared taxis. So uh, sharing the taxis of Lisbon, you know, the, the normal taxis of Lisbon. What if you share these cars? What would be the consequences uh, in terms of the level of service that the taxis offer uh, in the city? And at that time, we got some results on, uh, again, one of the most important indicators of level of service is the average waiting time. So you see that if you are a shared taxi user, you are going to experience, uh, on average, a lower waiting time for uh, a taxi. 
Of course, that maybe this is not fantastic for the taxis. If your demand is the same, this would mean that some taxis are actually empty. Um, then later, if you do the demand study, you'll see that probably if you have a lower waiting time, you attract more people to use the taxi. So in this sense, we don't have this in this uh, study. Um, it was one of the, I would say, earliest studies in which agent-based modeling was used for shared cars. Um, and it was the basis of another study that maybe some of you have heard about, which is the ITF model, uh, the Lisbon case study model that has been built by the OECD. Most of the people, when they, at least in Europe, when they talk about shared mobility, they talk about that study. So this was the first model, and then later, a more sophisticated model was built by that organization, because the guy that built this model went to work for, for the OECD. Why am I doing it to Delft about this type of issues, of door-to-door uh, uh, -door connections with shared vehicles? I have a, a student. Senlei Wang is doing his PhD on door-to-door -door shared automated vehicles. You know, it seems like everybody's kind of doing these models. There's, uh, for example, the Karakokumas model from Texas is one example, but there's more examples. Of course, if you talk about Matsin, they are doing a lot of uh, interesting work with a very good description of what happens in terms of traffic congestion, for example. Um, but I'm more on the operations side. I've been always more on the operations side and planning, meaning how many vehicles do you need? How should you match the demand with the supply? How should you route the vehicles? In this case, Senlei is working on trying to have some kind of mesoscopic traffic model behind so that now the vehicles really have a delay on the network. So the, the number of vehicles that you have on the network is going to influence the, the travel time. And he wants to test concepts like uh, platooning, for example, which inside the city we are seeing that is not a big advantage because you know, on freeways it makes more sense. But in urban areas, it's going to be the traffic lights that are going to cause delays. And you may not be gaining a lot of energy savings from platooning inside cities. But another thing that we are looking at is that maybe there isn't just one fleet operator. There's competition. There's different fleet operators. And maybe they are competing. Maybe they can work together to improve the level of service of uh, such a system. And this is something that he's also uh, looking at. This, this diagram is a bit complicated now here, but it's the full architecture of uh, such a shared uh, automated given system for door-to-door uh, -to -door transport. So he, here he doesn't have in mind first and last mile. He's ignoring the fantastic tram network that this city has, the city of The Hague, which is the administrative capital of, of the Netherlands. He's kind of ignoring that. And he presented some, some work at, uh, this week at uh, TRB. I have always some ideas of future research, what are future challenges about uh, um, this topic. Um, of course, that it's still an issue. How can you use such vehicles to uh, improve the usage of public transport? You know, there's studies. I know that you are also doing studies on that, Joe. So uh, more groups, more universities are doing these type of studies, but I think that there's still research to be done, optimizing, understanding really what could be the role for this and what are, for example, the impacts on mobility sustainability from using such vehicles. Where should you use them? Where should you not use them? Um, and again, here is more the door-to-door -door transportation, uh, like Uber systems. Can you, should you really allow them to operate? Are they just adding more traffic congestion? What are the strengths or weaknesses and opportunities of, and threats of such systems? And the question is, will it bring back cars to city centers? Because I know that cities in Europe, many cities are not going to allow cars. Should they allow shared cars to operate because they are special? Uh, well, how special are they? Are, are they really special? Meaning, are they, for example, pulling people together? Because if, if people are not sharing the same vehicle, if it's like a taxi, it's bringing cars back, and maybe it's not so uh, sustainable. 
and about mass mobility as a service, um, some people seem to associate mass a lot with ride hailing, with the Uber systems, etc. And uh, other people associate it more with public transport. Um, in reality, the definition is that it's, it's everything. But uh, we have to understand uh, how much of each part is it mass uh, all about and how can the different modes of transport support each other? Again, going back to that question of uh, public transport interaction with uh, on-demand uh, transportation. And also, I like to look at the electric mobility uh, as well. As I said, the, the lab is also focused on the electric mobility side. And one of the things that is being put forward about uh, electric mobility or electric shared mobility is that we can use these cars as batteries to try somehow to balance the power usage in a city because you have these huge peaks of demand for power in the city, not just in the city, but in the overall power network that you have in a region. So there's this idea that you can use the vehicles in a vehicle to grid relationship that you could benefit uh, from that. As people saying, okay, buildings can be smarter now. They can generate power, and then maybe they can drop this power to the fleet of the vehicles. And there's this complex system between mobility and the built environment. So we need to kind of explore possibilities also in that um, direction. Uh, kind of to finish the presentation, I want to mention the conference that we are organizing there at TU Delft. Actually, today is the deadline for paper submission, so it's not the best day to advertise the conference. If you, have to ha if you want to have a 10 pages paper, it would be uh, a bit difficult, but uh, maybe with a special request. Uh, but we have another deadline for presentation only, where you can submit an abstract and uh, you will present. You will not have your paper reviewed by peer review. Um, and it's a conference supported by IEEE, IEEE ITS specifically, and we mean to have both you know, scientists but also practitioners, some policy makers. Of course, that a lot of people are coming from the Netherlands because it's, it's, uh, it's our venue, it's our location, but we are also going to attract people from all over the world a bit. And uh, the three hot topics are, of course, connected automation, shared mobility, and electrification of uh, transportation system. So who knows? Maybe one of you could still come uh, in time. And uh, this is my last slide. Um, and I actually shared already with a few people that uh, if you want to know more about demand modeling as well, because I have some studies on the demand modeling side, you know, the typical logic model estimation with coefficients and developed travel time, I also have some slides where I can mention some of these results because there's a few papers about that. Um, and I already, one of your colleagues has mentioned one of those uh, papers. But this was my, my main message. This is ongoing work, okay? Everything is debatable. Well, we, what's published is published. Uh, you can still debate it, but uh, uh, what is not published, it can still be changed. And we are always searching for ideas of how to improve our research. I have actually two postdoc positions. Uh, the deadline, I think, was today or yesterday. But, it, but it, it, you know, it's we can be a bit flexible, okay, with uh, with that. Even because the second position is for another project um, that is is coming up, and uh, uh, that's I, I try to join this with the other one because I need the, this this person to enter very fast. Um, so one was about car sharing uh, impacts, and another one is about, in general, let's say, modeling automated vehicles with possibly agent-based modeling, activity-based modeling. And I cannot mention many more things because there's a big client that is uh, giving us this, this funding and we still have to decide on we can share this information, but we are definitely going to have a postdoc researcher working on that for one year. Both are for one year, okay? Uh, 
I would say that the most uh, focused on modeling is the other one. So that the agent-based modeling uh, shared automated vehicles, let's say. The other one is more evaluating the impacts of uh, car sharing. It has to do with uh, bringing data from cities. We have a project called, uh, called uh, SUSMO. Uh, we are working together with several cities in Europe. And you know that even though cities typically want to have shared mobility, they want because it's, it's now, you know, it's, it's almost about marketing. Everybody wants to have shared mobility. But in terms of evaluating, the cities don't have the skills most of the times to evaluate even the data that they get from the companies. You know? They have uh, agreements with the companies, they get data, but then they don't have the personnel with the skills to analyze that data. So we are going to have uh, to, to help a few cities uh, doing that in this project. That's one of the positions. Any questions? Yeah. So any question? Don't be shy. So I have a question. Uh, I do your research on the benefit of automation and uh, mobility as a service. Used in mobility as a service. I mean, what's the What's the main advantage of automating this service? Yeah. So, one is going to be the costs, because at least in Europe, 40 to 70 percent of the costs of operating public transportation systems are the drivers. They are very expensive, so the salaries are not that low. Okay, so they are skilled labor, and you can cut these uh, costs. I would say that, and that I have, don't have the proof, but managing also these uh, uh, relocations could be easier because you're not dependent on finding the driver or transporting the driver to the point in which the vehicle is located and then bringing that vehicle to another point. No, immediately the vehicle can uh, start moving to another point. So I think that could make the management real time of the system um, much easier. Uh, we can also debate a bit about how the vehicles are going to be redesigned in their interior. Uh, today, your car is pretty much the car that we have been having in the past uh, century. Right? It's, it has a seat for the driver, it has two seats in the back. If you lose the driver, you may be able to redesign your car in such a way that it can create an environment for work, for a bit of leisure, for example, could eventually make it more attractive. But that's also another research question. We're doing a lot of research about that. What are the perceptions of people? What is really what, what they feel inside an automated vehicle? And for that, we have done some state of preference, which can only be criticized because it's state of preference. But we are also doing some uh, live pilots where we put people inside the vehicles and then telling us what is their experience. You know. The vehicles have to evolve as well in terms of uh, the, the driving uh, comfort because today the cars have trepidation, right? I cannot work inside a vehicle. I have never been able to even read a page inside a vehicle. So it's not just about making the vehicle automated, it's making the vehicle very stable so that you can work inside a vehicle or have leisure reading a book or playing a game. And uh, this is things that are challenges for mechanical engineering, for example. Uh, I don't know so much about this, but we work together with those people. And I think it's not that close yet that you can make this perfect car. But you know, in theory, these are kind of the benefits that I'm seeing uh, right now, answering your question on the fly. So when you compare, one of your studies, you uh, compare the performance of the electric taxi and also the conventional taxi. Mm -hmm. Do you use the modeling framework or just use the simulation to compare these two types of taxi? We, in that particular study, yeah. it's a very simplified study because it's an optimization study. Oh. And our power consumption is only dependent on the distance. Does it depend on only accelerations, the efficiency of the traffic, nothing. So it's just, you know, one kilometer, kilometer more, a bit more energy. It's the same constant uh, need for energy per kilometer. It's very simple. And then what you do in the model is that you model taxis 
as um, actually in that model, I think we do it individually. Each taxi is represented by a bunch of decision variables, where the taxi is going to go next. And as the taxis move more, you get the power that the taxis are uh, spending, and then you need to charge the taxis. Yeah, so you don't consider the matching contrast between the taxi and the I mean, passengers. You are talking, let me see, you're talking about that state, the, the train station and the area around the train station, I think. It's from Xiaoyan, my, my PhD student, when we were back. Oh, ah, I, I, here, I, I, right? Here, the, the this matching. one, these yeah, results, this one. right? Yeah. 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 So here we do a matching, but it's actually the, let's say, the perfect matching is if you know all the demand during a day, okay. because we are solving oh. one mathematical program. Okay. So we could say it's a bit unfair. It's an upper bound for the matching, but yes, we match the requests with the taxes that you have in the optimization model. Okay, and what she later has done is that she also handles real-time requests. So she does a rolling horizon perspective. So she doesn't optimize for a full day like she does everything that is going to happen. No, she optimizes uh, rolling horizon by rolling horizon. So you assume that actually there is a center control the all the taxes. Yes, indeed. The totally. object is to maximize the profit. The profit, indeed. Very simply put, that's, that's what we are doing. Uh, in this case, we don't even look at delays of, uh, of, of the passengers, so it's, it's a bit simplified, uh, I would say. And I, I think I made a mistake, because I just told you that we treat each tax individually. I think that in this one, we didn't. It was a flow of taxes. So it has one decision variable, which is the flow of taxes from one node to the other. There's a big challenge in this type of models. If you model each tax individually, you can actually model the power that each vehicle is spending, which is good because whenever the vehicle reaches a certain level that is very low, you can say, go to charging through the optimization model. Um, that's good, but the problem is that if you do an individual taxi model, it's a huge model because you need to model so many vehicles. So here we aggregate. What is the problem of aggregated, of, of aggregating our model? Saying there's 100 taxis going from A to B and not distinguishing the taxis. Is that you don't know what was the route of, of the taxis. Everything is aggregated. So you can actually know how much power has been spent by all of the vehicles till a certain point in time. But you don't know if one vehicle has spent much more than the other one. So you cannot give instructions to specific vehicles to be charging. So we had to come up with a simplification of the decision to charge. Uh, basically, it was an average decision. Whenever some power has been spent on a whole system, you need to charge some cars randomly. So it was a simplification. Thank you. So recently, there's been this trend, at least in North America, of car share companies dropping out of cities. OK. And yeah, the car go. I heard something about car to go. Yeah. Uh, so, do you know the reasons? Yes, maybe the operation of cost. I, I don't know. I was going to ask you. Okay, you're going to ask me. <laughs> whether, whether there's what can I say? Salvage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, I don't know if uh, somebody from car to go is watching me. I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> just, just for general. But uh, you know, the question that we always had was: Is car to go making money? We're suspecting that car to go was not making money with most of their uh, operations in, in cities. But of course, they could speak better. This is not data that they like to share, of course, because it's their business secret, so to speak. But it's not like car sharing could be very profitable. It's also a matter of marketing. It's having your cars on the road. And you know that car to go is owned by a, a car maker. So there's other factors that play a role on the decision of let's operate a car sharing system in the city. So maybe if policies change, if that's not so important anymore, and you just look at the pure profit of the system, and oh, this is not making a profit, or it's a very small profit, and maybe you give up. Uh, or it has to do with the competition with the ride-hailing companies, you know, because a car-sharing company now has this problem that I need to move to get my car, and I can just request for an Uber. It comes to my doorstep. It's a taxi system. So you lose this, this uh, 
this flexibility, this level of service, if you are a car sharing company. What is going to happen in the future, I think, is that there's going to be a merging of this concept. If it is automated, then there is a merging, natural merging. Why, why should I walk towards a station or a point in which my vehicle is parked? Because now the systems are free, float, they are not based in stations. Why should I walk if the car can come to me? Do you think there's a center for public agencies to fleets that kind of like regulate fleets like transit? Yeah, I tried to do some some research on uh, on that, and uh, we have actually a paper on Part D, which we try to analyze what are the costs and benefits for different stakeholders on the car sharing systems, the traveler, the car sharing operator the city, or the, the, the society, because there's a pollution dimension as well um, on this. And I don't really have an answer for you. Uh, my feeling was always that we can use car sharing when the demand is not very high. That yes, cities could be subsidizing even some car sharing companies in very particular situations. Uh, I would say maybe some first last mile operations but I don't have final results on that. But in that paper, particularly we're looking at, um, we want to have zero local emissions. And car sharing companies, many, are operating with electric cars. In Amsterdam, Car2Go operates with electric vehicles. This is good, this is nice. Um, and we were asking if this is also good for the operator. And this is where I'm going back to Car2Go and to this issue of why they stop operating. According to our calculations in that paper, uh, without having data from Car2Go directly, um, electric vehicles were still very expensive for car sharing companies. So this would be nice for lowering the emissions in the city center, but it's not nice for the uh, company that's operating the system because the cars are much more expensive. Car2Go is owned by a car maker. If a car maker, of course, makes available cars cheaper, then it's another story, right? But there's all these trade-offs, um, and there's these, these different stakeholders. As a traveler, I just want to travel fast with the cheapest price. That's what lowest cost. That's what I want. A city wants to have uh, electric vehicles and actually doesn't want to have a lot of private cars in the city. Um, a public transport operator, what do they want? that at least for the uh, network that they are operating, that they have a lot of clients, right? So if you put a car sharing service in a city, you are taking demand from the public transport. That's actually not very good, neither for the public transport agency, uh, nor for um, the sustainability of the city, because you are putting back people uh, in cars, right? So there's all these multiple views, and sometimes I feel that, at least in the past, there was a lot of advocating car sharing systems. It seemed like, oh, it's shared, it's good. And that's not what our studies showed. You have to be uh, critical uh, about that. You have to criticize the system and say, okay, let's find exactly how to use these systems, in which situations, and maybe, yes, the government could be willing to pay to subsidize a bit car sharing because they already subsidize a lot the traditional public transport. So why not be willing to also extend that in some situations to, to share them? I mean, this is always also happening here in the United States with Lyft and Uber. I think that Lyft is already being used for first and last mile. Some cities pay partnerships, partnerships right? So that's recognizing the value of these uh, of these uh, new transportation systems. Yeah. Um, are you guys also looking at uh, the reduction in idle time of vehicles? Like a lot of vehicles shared rights right now. I attended this session by Uber ADP team in New York ages two days ago, and they were talking about how a lot of the vehicles just move around with drivers, but with automated systems, probably a reduction of that in like the idle time where it's not being used by anyone. Because you put the vehicle where? Because, because right. if it's automated, where, where would you put the vehicle? So that's, uh, that's what I want to know. Like, do you put it at the station? Well, that's, that's a good question, by the way. 
I think that this is a good question because yes, it's automated, it doesn't have a driver, but um, it needs to be put somewhere if it's not being used, right? I can tell you what I have concluded from private automated vehicles because I've done some optimization model where we optimize the routing decisions but also the decisions of where to park. And what we saw is that if energy is not that um, expensive and if your parking lots are not uh, conveniently located next to the main origins and destinations of your city, it doesn't pay off for the vehicle to go away to this external parking lot and then return for when it's needed uh, because it's actually better to do this routing inside the city to be cheaper, okay? So it's a big trade-off between parking prices, um, parking spots that you want to keep in the city, uh, energy costs, but also value of travel time, so how much uh, people um, value their time inside a vehicle. Uh, I don't have a final answer for that, but uh, at least some studies that I have done pointed for the problem to still exist because it's just this trade-off. You know, you cannot just, what we had in mind before doing the study was, okay, if I put this external parking, which is zero cost, I don't charge for parking there. What I'm going to see is the automated vehicle off-peak going to the parking uh, lot. No, what I saw was that since the energy was not that expensive, I would see the vehicles going around the block. You know, actually not around the block because my model was not that complex and we don't really have blocks in Delft. I would see the vehicle just going back and forth in the street. So what the hell is happening? It's very strange. Of course, the car doesn't want to park. It's just there waiting for its owner because it was private automated vehicles, not shared. It was waiting for the owner to have another trip. Okay, so that's what was happening in the model. So a lot of issues still there with, the, with this, uh, this planning of cities of the future. The, the request satisfaction, so I mentioned, uh, mm. throughout your studies, you, 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 have, you have some assumption or like a threshold? Well, here, here we have to be honest, we don't have a demand model integrated on this. So here what we have is, I have this demand, which is the people who want to go from the train station to uh, the campus, right? And then I just say, I want to maximize the profit, I was saying to, to you, right? It's a maximization profit problem. And if it is not good for the profit, the system doesn't satisfy the profit. It's like a dictatorship system, there's uh, nothing for the client here. But later, we have been adding the choice of people into our optimization models. Of course, it's a, it's a big of a challenge, because in optimization, you want everything linear, and unfortunately, logic models are not linear, right? So we have extra challenges, and then we can face that problem in different ways. Is that because the, the fleet is capacitated and it's less than the That's why it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, pick up a lot of requests? Because you're solving that statically. I'm solving this statically, yes. So satisfying a client may be bad for the system because you are going to bring this person to a place yeah. and not finding a person back. So then some of these trips are actually canceled. But don't forget that in this problem, it's also a location problem at the same time. So um, I may cancel a zone if it has a lot of these negative trips. I just say I'm not satisfying any trip uh, here. Okay? So. What we did is that in the, the main scenario in this one, we said, if I turn on one of these zones, all of the trips with destination and origin in that zone must be satisfied. So that's why the location model makes sense. If I turn off, I lose those, those trips. Okay? If I turn on, I have to satisfy uh, the trips. But if you look at the whole number of trips, the potential trips from here to all of the area, I'm, I'm rejecting. What am I rejecting? that that you see here, these percentages. So 40 something percent there. So there's a lot of zones that don't have access to the share. For, for the third uh, for the third and the fourth um, here. row, yeah. yeah you see the when the free size becomes I mean change from five to ten. Mm -hmm. It's quite
rare. I mean, um, for the electric, the tested, the conventional tested, they have exactly the same performance regarding the benefit, request, satisfy. Yeah, because they don't make any difference. Um, the fact that the vehicle is electric yeah. here doesn't represent any liability on the system. They need to charge a bit. But I have too many vehicles for actually for the demand okay. that I have. So the fact that they need to charge for some time doesn't represent anything because actually here I already have idle vehicles for some time. And that uh, time is enough to charge uh, the vehicles. But the, the, what's the battery size for the electric car? Oh, and good question. The, you have you would have to look at the paper, I don't remember anymore. Uh, we had in mind, I think that, I hope that I'm saying the truth, because we had in mind the Renault Twizy. All of this work was always made on the Renault Twizy. So I hope that the battery size, capacity, was always based on the Renault Twizy, which is not amazing. The, the range of the vehicle is like 60 kilometers. 60 kilometers. Yeah, it's not, it's not a lot. If you, have you seen one of these vehicles? It seems a bit uh, weak. <laughs> it doesn't seem very robust. It doesn't even have uh, um, what you call uh, windows, side windows. It's open. So if you want windows, you have to pay a bit extra. <laughs> so it's uh, it's funny. Yeah. Something else. <laughs> 